uh, it was clear to all of us that we didn't have enough money left to finish what, what it was that we were building. Uh, and so it was really, should we just give up? Like, should we stop? Or is there a plan B? Like, what else can we do here? Welcome to the Conversion Aid Podcast, where we help software entrepreneurs to take their business to the next level. Each week, we interview proven industry experts who share their strategies and insights to help you create software that sells. Here's your host, Omer Khan. Hey everyone, welcome to the Conversion Aid Podcast. In this episode, I talked to a founder who self-funded his startup. With $100,000, he set out with a small team to build the ideal product. Uh, almost a year later, they blew most of that money and they still didn't have a product in market. So they knew that they either had to quit or they could pivot. And what they decided to do was to take one feature from the product that they were building and turn it into a standalone product. Within a week, they had a crappy website up and running and they char started charging right away. Today, that startup has an annual run rate of over half a million dollars and is profitable. Uh, in this episode, we talk about how my guest pivoted, uh, the mistakes he made along the way, and how doing some counterintuitive things actually helped him to grow the business. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, I want to give a shout out to a listener for um, submitting an iTunes review. Uh, this one is from Heinrich Leisner uh, from Ireland. I hope I pronounced that correctly and I'm sorry if I didn't. Uh, it's titled, It is All About Value. And it says, for a long time, uh, for a long while, I have listened to Omer's podcast, and I have to say there is a lot of value in each episode. Real insights and refreshingly honest conversations take this podcast to a new level. Thanks very much. Uh, I really appreciate that. Thank you for the feedback. Um, it's, it's always great to get the feedback from you guys, whether you submit an iTunes review or whether you just email me or tweet me, um, all of those things matter. So thank you. And thank you, Heinrich, for uh, submitting this this review on iTunes. Again, before we get started, if you haven't joined the Conversion Aid community, now is a great time to do that. You'll get notified of new episodes right in your inbox. And it's a great way to learn from successful SaaS founders and entrepreneurs. Just go to conversionaid.com slash VIP and you can enter your email address there. All right, let's get on with the interview. All right, today's guest is the co-founder and CEO of CloudSponge, a product that helps businesses to acquire more users via their email referral forms. Now, most referral forms ask you to type in your friend's email addresses. With CloudSponge, it's possible to give users access to their contacts directly uh, without even leaving your website. The company was founded in 2010, is self-funded, and its customers include companies such as Lyft, Yelp, and Airbnb. So today, I'd like to welcome Jay Gibb to the show. Jay, welcome. Thanks for having me. Now, one thing I always like to ask people when they uh, come and join me is uh, what, what drives them, what motivates them. So, you know, what gets you out of bed every day to do what you do? Well, today... It was this interview. <laughs> Good day, answer. <laughs> you know, what, what I've actually found, I was thinking about that question I knew you were going to ask me. And for me, every day, it's a little different. I don't think there's one thing that is the theme from day to day. You know, sometimes it might be, uh, you know, yesterday I was really excited about watching some inspectlet replays of our, some changes that we made to our onboarding funnel. And like I said, today I was I woke up thinking about this interview. And so for me, it's, it's kind of, it changes on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't know if that's a, the answer you're hoping for, but that's the truth. That's a great answer as any. So I, I kind of explained to the audience a little bit about cloud sponge, but it would be great if, if you could tell the audience uh, a little in your own words, uh, what cloud sponge is and you know, who your target customers are, what, what problem are you trying to solve for them? Yeah, so he, you said it well. Um, you know, the, the easy way to think about it is that we provide tools that let our customers uh, put address books on their websites so that people don't have to flip between 
tabs and windows to go back and forth finding people's email addresses. And usually that makes itself useful in referral forms and places where uh, companies, you know, they really want to get remove the friction point of, of people having to either have their friends and family's email addresses memorized or, or to, like I said, flipping between tabs and windows. Uh, so our most popular use cases for, for those kinds of, you know, two field, uh, populator to, to populate a two field with email addresses. Um, but we also have companies like Yelp, for example, that uses us for their friend, like find a friend feature. So they'll, you know, if you go to Yelp and you, you, you go to their find friends feature, uh, there's a tool where they, you know, you can upload your address book, which is the same feature that exists in, in pretty much every social network. And they'll show you a, they'll match everybody in your address book with everybody who's in their database and kind of make it really easy for you to, to uh, connect with everybody that you already know who's there. Uh, so that's a use case that we've found for some of our crowdfunding companies and social network companies. So, so we're, you know, a single point of integration for the world's address books. And, uh, you know, it's kind of, um, there's, those are the, the two most popular use cases for that, for that address book connection. Tell me a little bit about kind of like the, the technology and what you guys are doing. So I understand from the front end, there's either a widget that your customers can use or an API to build their own experience. Um, and, and sort of what's happening in the back end, like you, you, you guys have basically built this platform, which, which handles all the integration with what, how many contact systems out there? Yeah, we, we call them address book providers or contact providers. Um, and right now I think we've got about 50, uh, and we've got, um, you know, it's, it's our, it's our focus to, to get them all around the world. So the big ones that people are all familiar with, you know, is Gmail, Yahoo, Outlook.com, uh, are the big ones, iCloud. Uh, those are the ones that most of our customers, you know, want by default. Um, but then we've got, you know, AOL and, you know, a lot of ISP address books and uh, popular address books in Brazil and Germany and Russia and China and different uh, markets that our, uh, our customers are trying to penetrate. And so it's, um, it, for us, the back end part is really connecting to all those places, normalizing, normalizing all that data, making it look uh, the same uh, regardless of where it came from so that our customers don't have to worry about those differences. Uh, and then, you know, the core product is the API. And then on top of that API, we've got, you know, the, the JavaScript widget, which is really f for people who, uh, they want to get started quickly and they want to have a way to display an address book in, in a web page. Uh, they can install our widget just in a couple minutes to just paste the JavaScript and, and, and do, do a couple small configuration steps to get it, get it going. Uh, the API is, is, is really for more special use cases or bigger companies that have, you know, large, uh, development teams already, very sophisticated groups, or they've got, you know, a, a branding and marketing department that just can't live with the way that our widget looks. Uh, then they'll invest in building their own UI uh, that just sits on top of our API the same way that our own widget does. Uh, so that's kind of how the, the stack looks. Where did you get the idea for this product and business? It was a, it, it was a pivot, actually. We, we started off uh, in 2009 building something totally different. Uh, it was, it was a, a, a tool that we were calling internally, we were calling Cloud Copy. And it was for uh, the, the value proposition was really for people to make a copy of their data that was out there in the cloud, which at the time many people didn't trust as much as they do today. And it was a tool that was going to let, let them make a copy of that data and store it locally somewhere that they could, they could touch. Uh, and so we, uh, we set aside um, a budget of a hundred thousand dollars with our agency and we started building this thing and, and we got probably about, $80,000 of the way through it. And we hadn't gotten anywhere near uh, getting something built that we felt was ready for market. Uh, but one of the things that we had spent a lot of time building and a lot of problems that, that we weren't anticipating was the contact importing part. So we had spent, we had spent time looking at these tools like, like open inviter at the time 
and there was a company called Octazen that was later acquired by Facebook. And there was uh, Plaxo had uh, like an address book importing widget. And so we kind of went through all the things that were out there that were available for this contact importing problem and nothing was good. Nothing worked. We had to, we basically felt like we had to build something ourselves. And as we were going down that path and we were solving those problems and we were building it ourselves for this other business that we were trying to build, uh, we noticed that there were lots and lots of other developers asking the same questions we were asking. And we were in Stack Overflow, we were in Quora, we were in like, Google and Yahoo and Microsoft developer forums trying to solve problems and figure things out. And we weren't alone. Like There were tons of people out there asking the same questions. And so when, you know, as, as the founder, like <laughs> when I started to see the, that we were sprinting into a brick wall and we were going to run out of money and we, we hadn't gotten to where we wanted to get, um, you know, we sort of circled the wagons and looked and said, look, guys, like, it's clear that we're solving something, other, this problem that other people have. So let's put a price tag on this thing and just sell that and forget, sort of just abandon <laughs> the original idea uh, because we know that we're not going to get there. Uh, but we have, you know, in the journey of developing that, uh, we have identified that, you know, there is a strong signal that something that, you know, makes this contact importing contacts, you know, embedded address of a problem easier for developers to solve. Like we, we knew that we were going to be able to sell it and we knew sort of how to find the people who would buy it. So we did exactly that. We just, we, 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 you know, registered a domain name and, you know, made a, made a quick website that was pretty ugly and put a price tag on it and, and started to, started to talk about it with those developers and those communities where we were, we already were. And sure enough, they loved it, and they were super happy that somebody was dedicating their professional lives to to solving this problem for them. And so they 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 paid us on day one. Like we we immediately had people that wanted to help us, and wanted to pay us, and wanted to to buy what we had. Uh, so it was it was it was a good feeling to have that that strong signal, um, you know, right at our <laughs> at our moment of weakness. Okay, so so I just want to be kind of clear, just so I understand this. Um, you you you'd, you'd self funded. You had about a hundred thousand um, dollars put into this business. You were working on this first uh, idea, which was this this cloud copy product, um, and you got to spending about eighty thousand of that, um, and you still didn't have the product in market at this point. Is that right? Right. Yep. Right. And the contact importing wasn't a separate product at the time. It was just a feature for the overall product that you were trying to build. Um, and that's when you, you decided that maybe the, the demand that we're seeing here and people talking about this, maybe this is the thing that we should focus on. You got it. You said you put you built the website and, and put a price tag on it. So what were you doing? You were just going to places like Quora and... And, and Stack Overflow and whatever, and just telling people like, hey, you just, you, you're kind of struggling with this. We, we have this product. You might want to check it out. Yeah, maybe not. We weren't quite so shameless about it, but yeah, <laughs> that, effectively that's what it was, right? It was, it was a little bit more strategic. You know, we would have our, our, our company name, our URL in our signatures, and uh, we were helpful. We would just answer people's questions because we were smart and we were able to answer them. And then when... When CloudSponge, when our contact importing solution was the answer, like it was the, the actual legitimate answer to the question, then we would mention it and we would link to it. And then we would do the usual disclaimer that says, hey, by the way, I work for CloudSponge so that we didn't get banned and didn't have people getting upset that we were like shamelessly plugging our own product. Uh, but yeah, that was really it. It was, it was just being, you know, participating in these forums and answering questions and being helpful. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we ended up, those are, those are still things. This was, this was 2010. So this is six years ago. And those are still links that drive traffic today. Like the, those, those threads have paid dividends permanently. Wow. Yeah. From the point where you started the first product and you started spending the, the hundred K uh, and to the point where you had 80K spent and, and felt that you were kind of, you know, 
banging against a, a brick wall. How long was that period? Like how long were you trying to build that product? Uh, it was about a year, I guess. Okay. I'm not sure. I, I, nobody's asked me that question before, so I'm not totally sure, but I want to, I want to say it was probably about a year. Okay. So about a year. And then yeah. you hit the, the, the kind of the aha moment. Look, this isn't working. We need to do something else. And you decide to pivot, build the new website and, and start, you know, putting prices up there. I'm curious how, how long that time took compared to the year you spent on the first product. You mean putting up a web page with a price on it? Um, doing that as well as making the decision to pivot. Like you, you decide I'm going to pivot. Okay. What are we going to pivot to? Um, what was, what was that whole kind of period look like? We'll be talking about six months, a few weeks. Oh, that was a few days, I think. I think we kind of got to a point where uh, it was clear to all of us that we didn't have enough money left to finish what, what it was that we were building. Uh, and so it was really, should we just give up? Like, should we stop? Or is there a plan B? Like, what else can we do here? Should we go raise more money? Do we, how, <clears throat> how much do we believe in this idea? Uh, and we just, it was clear because we had spent so much time cracking this contact importing nut that it was something that had value. So we just decided that that decision to do that and the, you know, putting up a page and kind of getting, getting that started, that was very fast. It was maybe a week. How many customers did you initially get and how long did it take you to get those first few customers? So the first few customers, some of this, you're, you're asking me to go into a, a pretty old vault. So I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't have a perfect memory that far back. Uh, but, but the initial couple customers came immediately where, you know, we were able to like talk to people that we were already in the same forums as and just ask them, Hey, would you buy this? And they said yes. So we just put up a website and let them buy it. I think the first, like well-known brand at the time that got us really excited and made us feel like, like we were onto something was a company called Causes. Have you heard of Causes before? I haven't. It's kind of like, it was in the fundraising space for, it was similar to GoFundMe. This is way before GoFundMe existed, but it was where you could, you know, in, instead of instead of getting your friends and family to buy you a birthday gift, you could sort of put on social media that you wanted them to make a donation to, you know, some nonprofit that you preferred or something like that. Uh, and at the time, you know, this is six years ago, they were, they're a relatively well-known brand. Uh, and I get, I'm not sure what they're up to now. They're, they're, they're not with us anymore. Um, but we were real excited to see causes come online. Um, and that was fairly early on. Like that was within the first month of, of pivoting. So, so that's really interesting that uh, almost a year of building a product, um, not, not much progress. And then suddenly everything seems to turn around in about a month. And I think it's kind of easy for people maybe to look at that and say, well, um, you know, maybe, maybe that, that first year was a waste of time and, and you guys should have gone to that second idea or whatever. But yeah, I think in many ways it, it was, it was kind of getting started and spending that first year in terms of trying to solve maybe a different problem that took you onto the path of figuring out what the right problem to solve was, right? Because because I think a lot of the times many of us kind of get stuck in not doing, not taking any action because we're trying to look for the perfect idea instead of just getting started with something. Yeah, maybe. I think in this case it was it was clear that this was a painkiller, right? Like we were, we were in these communities with, with hundreds of developers who were all asking the same questions about questions about Google contacts, API integration, or how to do, you know, very specific geeky parts of integrating with these different APIs or fixing PHP bugs with open inviter or, you know, getting Octazen installed and or all these different tools that people were trying to use, like we saw like this signal, right? So it was at that point, it was really more of, of just uh, not letting ego get in the way and just basically saying, look, like we had this idea that we really liked, but we didn't, we didn't do it. We didn't get there. We didn't make it to the finish line during that journey. 
but we learned something. We identified this problem that exists that we previously didn't even know was a problem. Uh, and so I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it for the world. I mean, we had to, we had to go through that pain to discover that a problem, this problem existed. Mm -hmm. Otherwise we just didn't know that it existed beforehand. It's not like, it's not like this is something that we knew about and just disqualified, right? It was like, right. we just, we discovered that it was an opportunity while we were trying to do something completely different. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And did you get any pushback from, cause, cause your customers and the people who are solving this are mostly going to be tech guys. They're going to be developers. Cause I think when you, when you initially look at this and say, Oh, you know, like, I don't know, doing Gmail integration. Well, well, Google has their API. I could kind of go and build something myself. Why do I have to pay somebody? Did you get any of that kind of pushback from people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we still do. Uh, I guess I guess a lot of the pushback is probably silent, where you know people just they see that we exist and they say to themselves, "Well, I could do this myself." Um, and, and a few of those people are vocal about it, where they'll come to Cloud Sponge, start a trial, kick the tires, and then when we ask them, "Hey, why didn't you convert? Like, why? You know, I see that you started a trial. Like, why?" did you not become a paying customer of ours? Uh, there's some people will say, well, because I'm, I'm just going to integrate with Gmail by myself. Uh, and that's, that's a valid answer that, you know, if, if that's what they want to do, I think the people that really appreciate cloud sponge the most are the ones who, who don't want to build too much software and don't want to have to maintain those, those integrations uh, for certainly the ones that want two or more of these integrations, you know, they want, they want Gmail and they want Yahoo and they want Outlook.com and they might want AOL and iCloud and a few more. Uh, you know that technical effort starts to multiply, uh, and you know it's usually a smarter decision to focus your your product effort and your technical time time on whatever is your unique selling proposition, whatever is like the thing that makes you different. Uh, I think it's a pretty easy argument to say that you know building address book importing is is a distraction for most companies. Uh, in fact, it's a distraction for all companies except for mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. So yeah, there are certainly people that, that prefer to build things themselves. Um, but you know, they're, yeah, they're just, they're not the people that convert. Yeah. Any, any developer type person often looks at a problem and the immediate response is, I can build that myself. And that's something I do as well. And I'm kind of guilty of that where, you know, if, if I kind of look at a, there's a product to go and solve a particular problem I have, or I could spend what I think might be a couple of days to kind of build something myself. I'm like, well, maybe I'll just do that. Right. That sounds like it's going to be better. Um, and from what I understand, that's what you guys did as well with your product, right? at some point? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're a bunch of engineers, right? Or at least, at least I used to be. And, and most of the people at cloud sponge, certainly at the point in the timeline that we're talking about right now, we're, we're engineers. And so our, our default, our like instinct in most cases is to add features and issues and, and build stuff. And it, it, you know, it wasn't until we made, some mistakes in, in doing that and, and sort of bloating our own software uh, with, with other things such as our own internal recurring billing logic or our own internal reporting tools or our own return, uh, internal dashboards and things like that uh, where we started to realize like, wow, like we, sh we should really not spend our energy building these things that we could go buy uh, from other companies as SaaS products. And, and granted, nowadays, there are thousands of those companies and products available that, that didn't exist six years ago. But, uh, you know, nowadays, we're, uh, as part of our internal uh, priority is, is really trimming all that fat and, and deleting massive, massive chunks of code that we've written over the years and replacing them with third-party services, replacing... Like I said, right now, like for example, we're going through a project to to replace some fairly complex and, and nuanced uh, recurring billing code with a third-party product called Chargeify. 
And so far that's been really cathartic and, and helpful. And it's helped us to realize that, you know, we really shouldn't have built this in the first place. Uh, we should really have done a, a, a more, uh, been more disciplined about buying before building. What do you think was the, the cost of, I mean, not in financial terms, but what do you think it cost you guys by, by not, um, using uh, solutions that were already built instead of trying to do most of it yourself? Uh, yeah, I haven't really tried to quantify that before, so I'll, I'll take a stab at it now. But I would guess, like, you know, if, if building something was going to take a developer two weeks to do, that probably came with at least – at least a couple of days a month forever, right? <laughs> yeah, of, that's a good of way like, to think about it. Of like maintenance, right? So there's this permanent tax that you're sort of adding to your own velocity once you do that. And if you do it all the time and you do it for all these things that appear to be just little two-week projects or little one-week projects or little two- or three-day projects, that each one of those comes with like a tax and there's probably some – universal constant that somebody else has calculated that we could look up there. But there's this maintenance tax that just happens and, 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 and we've felt the pain of that over and over again. And so I think when you ask the cost, it's really a, it's really a, there's a lot of different ways to calculate it. One of them is the financial cost, but the other one is <clears throat> what is the opportunity cost of how we could have spent all that time building our like unique product, the things that make us unique, the things that bring value to our customers, that instead of doing that, we've spent paying this tax, this velocity tax, let's call it. I'm just going to coin that term on your podcast right now. I like it. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. I want to kind of go back again. And, and I know we're kind of kind of spending time in an area which happened over five, six years ago. Um, but beyond the kind of the outreach you were doing and, and kind of posting on sites like Quora and, and sort of stack uh, overflow and those kinds of sites, what else did you guys do to get the word out um, about cloud sponge? So that's a, that's a skill that I'm still learning now. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not an expert at it at all in terms of, uh, you know, the outbound scalable marketing channels I'm getting better at it. Uh, but back then, you know, the getting into those communities and being helpful was huge for us. I mean, it brought a lot of, a lot of action. Um, the other thing that the, one of our sort of, I guess you could call it like a scalable engine was the, the powered by cloud sponge logo that's displayed on our widget. So people would go to causes or they would go to Kiva or they would go to one of these big sites and they, they would see, oh, there's this, this address book embedded into the website. Like, that's cool. How did they do that? And they would see powered by cloud sponge. Uh, and so that, that was a, a really important uh, distribution channel for us. And then there's this whole layer of, of software companies that where their products are improved by ours. So, you know, referral program software and, tools like WordPress plugins and Shopify plugins and Magento plugins and uh, different tools that are out there. There are dozens of them. Uh, they, they integrate with cloud sponge as well. And, and so they end up being a distribution channel for us where, you know, we'll get, we'll get installed on 10,000 or 30,000 websites all at the same time. Once we, you know, get one of those, uh, distribution channels or one of those companies to, to integrate with us. Uh, so that ends up being a, a pretty, a pretty scalable channel for us as well. So, okay. So you, you, you look for um, somebody who has, who needs that kind of functionality um, like, like kind of Magento type environment. And the bet is if we, if we kind of build ourselves into that, then that's going to be something we'll be able to reach all their, customers in in one way or another right 
So how, how, how do you, how do you do that kind of, is, is it kind of like a biz dev deal you have to go out and do, or is it just like getting the integration done or like, how, how does something like that work? So it's usually, in our case, it's normally been uh, an inbound lead. So these, these organizations that are, you know, building something that they're selling to a B2B audience, they'll, they'll, the same way that anybody else does, where they're out there searching for address book importer or something like that, and they find us organically or they find us on a stack overflow thread, the same way that most people do, uh, they'll come to us and then I'll personally, like, I look at everybody who, all of our leads, I personally lay eyes on all of them and I'll identify them. I'll see, oh, cool, this is like another company that, you know, is is selling, you know, a, a refer a friend tool or a, or a, a coupon delivery tool or, a, you know, a, a rewards program platform or something like that. And I'll reach out and, and talk to them and let them know that we can, we can establish a partnership together and, and negotiate terms for, for sharing traffic and, and, you know, sending customers to each other. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, looking back, um, over the last few years, is is there maybe a mistake that you can think of that you wish, if you could kind of go back in time, you would do differently? Oh, so many. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the the one the one that I think is most counterintuitive that I think your your listeners might be surprised by and, and maybe maybe learn from my mistakes or our mistakes is is we made the assumption that reducing friction in the onboarding process was obviously a good idea. Um, so for example, we would do things like giving people, giving our, our leads uh, a license, like a, a, a license that they could use, install CloudSponge into their development environment for free. So they could sign up. The first thing they would get would be a license. This license is available to you in your local host environment or your like Heroku or your Cloud9 environment or whatever, and it would work in that environment. But then as soon as they deployed to their production environment, they needed to come back and give us a credit card and buy the product, right? And that was the idea behind that. The reason why we did that uh, was to reduce onboarding friction. We figured, well, you know, we need these guys to get to their aha moment where they actually see our product inside their product, so that they start to fall in love with it and they can share it with their coworkers and their bosses and whatever else. And uh, it, it just, it turned out in hindsight that we do much better and so do our customers when we have gone to a considered sign up, which is where you sort of add friction to that. You say you don't, you can't use this in your development environment. You can't get anything from us until you give us a credit card number and start a trial and start that clock ticking. And, and really the reason for that, I think, and this is the jury's still out on this, but you know, it's, it, 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 it forces the, the person who's signing up to really make sure that they're ready to really make sure that this is, they're going to start a 14 day trial. They need to sort of be ready to prioritize this on their product roadmap. They need to make sure that every day for the next 14 days, they're like working through the integration and getting this thing done and, and functioning properly. And it adds that, that sense of urgency and that, that sense of importance to, to us. And it, it really helps with our conversion rates. It's, it's, it's really a dramatic difference in terms of, uh, the number of, of people who, what you would call, you know, an inbound lead, uh, you know, the conversion rate to paying customer when we have switched to a considered sign up where it's a little bit more friction, uh, is it's just nine days. It's dramatically better than when we had a sort of a low friction process. Now I, I can understand why the conversion rate might be better because as you said, you're getting people through your, your onboarding funnel who are going to be a lot more serious about making the investment, they know what they're going to have to pay. Um, and just, just some of the friction or the hurdles they have to get, get past before they can become, you know, start using your product. 
probably means a lot more of them are going to convert into, you know, ongoing customers. Uh, whereas I think people who are fans of the the freemium model, and, and let's say what you were doing before was kind of, you know, where you let people get up and running in their dev environment was kind of like a freemium model. Those people, I guess, would say, well, that's okay. You, you know, your conversion rates are going to be a lot lower, but you're going to get so many more people coming through that funnel that at the end of it, you're going to get more customers. But it doesn't sound like that was your experience either. No, it wasn't. You know, in the, at the end of the day, it ends up being uh, pretty much the top of the funnel stayed the same. We just converted more people at the bottom of the funnel. I'm curious, how did you figure out to do that? So you've got the, you've got this funnel set up and it's converting and, and you're like, okay, you know, how do we make this better? But, but how, how do you, how do you get to the point where we say, let's do the opposite of what we're doing? Yeah, it's, it's a combination of, of, of just sort of flattening where our, our revenue stopped growing as quickly as it previously was. And so we're starting to look at everything. We're starting to figure out, okay, like, you know, do we need to find new marketing channels? Do we need to optimize our current onboarding funnel? Do we need to, you know, optimize our landing pages and get more people to convert into inbound leads? Like where, where in this process do we have a lever that we can pull that we haven't pulled before? And at some point I read a really insightful blog post. I don't remember who wrote it, but it was a while ago that just kind of gave me the idea and said, well, you know, here's the difference between a, you know, a quick sign up and a considered sign up. And it was somebody else who'd had a similar, a similar experience where considered sign up was just much better for their business. And again, it was kind of counterintuitive. And so we put it on the list of experiments to try. Uh, and when we tried it, it, we had great results from it. So I think, um, you know, it's, it's got, a, for me, it, it, it's got a lot to do with just listening to podcasts like yours and reading blog posts that are sort of, you know, in the, in the category of problems that I'm currently thinking about or trying to solve. Uh, in that case, that's where the inspiration came from. I think that's so interesting because as you said, it, it's so counterintuitive. Um, but it just goes to show that there's no one way of doing anything and, and you shouldn't sort of take those for granted and you should continuously test and experiment. And um, just because something is working for somebody else doesn't mean that it's going to work for your product, your market or your customers. Right. So uh, I love that one. Um, tell me, tell me about, a little bit about the size of the team. Like how many people do you have right now? So, Cloud Sponge is, is a, a, a product that's managed and, and operated by my agency, which is called Arizona Bay. And so the, I, I have the luxury of being able to swap in and out resources for the agency as I need to. So as, as we, as we have free resources, I can put them to work on Cloud Sponge. As uh, Cloud Sponge no longer needs them, I can put them to work on the, at the, on the agency, uh, you know, client work and so on. And so it, at any given time, it fluctuates because of that. Um, but we do basically we operate right now with uh, three dedicated engineers, uh, full time. This is the only thing that those those three guys think about: my CTO and and two engineers that work under him. And then uh, you know me and uh, you know a marketing person and some sales and you know security and operations and some of that so and those are those are all individuals that work with with me for my agency uh so it's kind of it's it's a bit of a expanding and contracting team that sort of has a core group of of four of us and uh in terms of revenue what are you guys doing right now we're at about a half a million dollar run rate so that's not that's not bad at all considering you've only got three people working on that business. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've been, the business itself has been in the black, uh, since I think 2011 or so, uh, just because we're able to, we have low costs. I mean, we operate the business with a relatively small team and, and the overhead is relatively low. Uh, and so we're able to, you know, not, not have to worry about raising money and, and just operate off of our own revenues. 
So what's 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 next for Cloud Sponge? Where are you guys headed, and uh, what are you kind of most excited about when you think about the the sort of the next year for the product? The next year for the product, uh, we'll see our new widget come out. So our current widget is a little bit dated. You know, it's got it's got rounded corners. Can't have rounded corners anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's got it's got little drop shadow and little highlights and stuff. Like everything's got to be flat and material design nowadays. And so we have, you know, I'm, I'm cracking a joke, but you know, it is it is a little dated. And so we're, we've we've built a whole new one that's mobile first and is beautiful on all devices and works in portrait and landscape and everything and it's skinnable and so on. And so we're, we've been working hard on that for a few months and uh, we're looking forward to releasing that in, in the, in the summer. Um, and we've got uh, specifications written uh, for a new API and starting to work on a mobile SDK to make it so that mobile developers uh, who, who are building apps rather than just mobile friendly websites uh, can can integrate with our, our API a little bit more easily. Uh, so we've got those kinds of things on the horizon. And then, you know, we're also taking a really close look at the patterns and the use cases and the ways that our customers are using the product and the, the, the their, their specific use cases and, and starting to devise, uh, you know, some, some additional, additional products, additional things that we can build that will, um, you know, really help those customers succeed at, at what it is that they're trying to accomplish and, and basically just take a little bit more off of their plates and then make and bring a little bit more onto, onto our side of the, of the software equation. Okay, cool. Uh, and so I think it's interesting that I think we started this conversation talking about the, the idea of the email referral form and, and, um, you know, that, that kind of being the way to describe your business, but from, from the conversations we've had and the way you've been talking about this, I think you, you guys have a broader vision or a much broader vision for what cloud sponge is becoming, right? Yeah. I mean, we see, because we, we have the luxury of, of having so many customers and, and having them be so friendly and helpful with us. Uh, we're able to see what it is that they're building on their side to integrate with us. And, and through doing that, through having those conversations and being involved, uh, we see patterns. I mean, we see the, the you know, customer after customer building uh, the same thing on their side over and over and over again. And so it gives, it, it makes it really clear that there's an opportunity for us to take a little bit more of that software on, on our side and do more of that and, and provide more value to customers in different segments. So what that'll probably do for us is it'll take us from being arguably kind of a generic tool that, you know, is like an address book that, you know, lives on your website that can be customized and takes us into some, some more specific products that, that address the specific use cases that, that we see people, people using it for. Great. All right. It's uh, time for our lightning round. I'm going to ask you a series of questions and uh, just, just answer them as quickly as you can. You ready? Sure. What's the best piece of business advice that you've ever received? Uh, you know, this is all, I mean, it's going to be kind of a boring answer for you, but, um, it's, it's a good one. And that's just start charging for your SaaS product on day one or day zero. Um, don't, don't even try to start with a, you know, without charging people. I think, I think having people give you a credit card number and, and actually put their money on the line, um, is critically important to you actually knowing whether or not you have something that can turn into a real business. Yeah, t totally. Because I, I think that, that some, sometimes we, we're, we're scared that asking for a credit card might, people might say no. And if we don't, if we don't charge them initially, then there's kind of, I don't know, you, you kind of always have this hope that it's going to turn into a successful business. But I guess the sooner, Sooner you get to the, you know, the rubber hits the road and, and you, you kind of get them to, to commit. I think the sooner you're going to know how successful your, your business has the potential to be. Yeah. I mean, if they say no, then you get to ask why, right? Yeah. <laughs> but if you never ask them for a credit card number, then they never say no and you never get to ask why. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, what book would you recommend to our audience and why? The answer to that one probably changes 
monthly <laughs> or at least a couple times a year. Uh, the one that I'm getting or I got the most value out of in the last several months, six months or so is Traction by Gabriel Weinberg, which is for a product guy like me who's sort of just learning learning how to how to do marketing. Um, it was it was such a critical playbook. I mean, it's it's basically broken down into 19 chapters that articulate the 19 marketing channels that Gabriel Weinberg has identified, and kind of gives you ideas for how to how to evaluate them and experiment with them. And it was uh, it was ex- you know for me it just came at a really relevant time, so maybe that's why I like it so much. But it's a uh, it's a it's a really great book. It should be on everybody's bookshelf, I think. Yeah, I agree. And, and Gabriel was a guest on the show back on episode thirty three and thirty four, where we talked about DuckDuckGo, and then we spent one episode just talking about the Traction book. Um, and I love the way that he's kind of really um, with uh, who's his co-author Justin Mears, I think, right? In terms of just coming up with a really nice framework for people to think about how you how you just tackle the whole concept of of growth. So uh, I like that a lot too. Uh, all right, what's uh, one attribute or characteristic in your mind of a successful entrepreneur? You know, when I think about the people in my network that are the most successful entrepreneurs, the thing that the pattern that I see, the thing, one of the things that I, I think they all have in common is they're. They're all really good at developing like business relationships where everybody wins. I don't know if there's a word for that. I don't know if there's a way to describe that in a word. Um, maybe I mean a lot of I guess the current buzzword is, is is customer success, right? Where you've got you've got a situation where everybody who's involved in in, in CloudSponge's case, that's that's CloudSponge itself, that's my customer, and that's their user, where all three of us are winning. We're all, it's a win-win-win partnership, and the presence of CloudSponge in that is, is what makes it, um, makes it good for everybody. And uh, that, would, I would say, is the thing that when I, when I look at you know, my, my co-founder and, and you know, a lot of the, the people that we've worked with who've succeeded, uh, that's one attribute that is universal in that group. Every single one of them, they, they just look for those. They look for those ways to to create relationships where where everybody wins. What's your favorite personal productivity tool or habit? So I don't know. I don't know if this is a popular one yet. I guess maybe it's getting to be more and more popular. But email snoozing. Do you do, do you snooze your emails? I do. I started doing that a few months ago. <laughs> oh man! I mean, I, I guess it was pioneered by Mailbox, which is now gone because Dropbox shut it off after they acquired it. But man, I mean, now it's like anybody who's using vanilla Gmail, if they switch to Inbox by Google, it's got a snooze feature, uh, and and so to I'm sure lots of other clients. I'm currently experimenting with Polymail and and Nihilus N1 that both have it. And and really just basically just getting an email and saying, you know what, I'm not going to deal with this until such and such a date. So re-deliver it, and you know, on that date is has just it's it's basically removed the email processing part of my professional life, or reduced it down to a few minutes a day. It's like it's just genius. It's amazing. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I use um, I actually use the Microsoft Outlook app on my iPhone now. And to me, it's, it's one of the best email apps that, that I've tried on the iPhone. And it's not because I used to work for Microsoft. Um, well, I have an iPhone, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, and, and it has the same snooze functionality built into that. And, and uh, yeah, I love it. Um, what's a new or crazy business idea you'd love to pursue if you had the extra time? You know, I, I'll, I'll change that question on you. I'm not really sure what the business idea is. Um, but I think the problem that I would attach myself to is really climate change and specifically finding a way to get more kids to pursue STEM career paths in hopes that they start to contribute to our, our climate change problem. I think it's, uh, it's a big deal that I could, I could bite down on and really, really enjoy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, those are, those are kind of one of the things. I, I started reading um, the blog post series about uh, Elon Musk on wait. Do, do you familiar with wait, but why? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So so uh, so Tim is. I just love his writing style and and kind of 
that that was for me was like when you just start to really kind of go into a little bit depth and sort of figure out what Elon Musk is kind of trying to do for the future of humanity and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, These are like some really, really, you know, big problems, but somebody has got to do something about those. Otherwise, you know, are we we screwed? I don't know. (laughs) Let's hope not. All right. Uh, What's uh, an interesting or fun fact about you that most people don't know? I still can't resist a good mosh pit. A, what? A, a mosh pit. I, I, I grew up in high school. I grew up going to punk rock shows. And so I still go. I still love oh. to go to, you know, bands, you know, like No Effects and Bad Religion and Pennywise and bands that, you know, from the, the early 90s kind of pop punk bands. Yeah. And I'm way too old for it now, but I still like, I still can't resist getting in there with the, in a good mosh pit. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I still can't resist trying to break dance sometimes, even though I probably break my neck trying to do it these days. <laughs> nice. Nice. And, and finally, what is one of your most important passions outside of your work? Well, right now, the only thing I have time for is my kids. I love them. And uh, we got, I got two, a uh, three-year-old and a one-year-old, and then the one on the way. Wow. Congratulations. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Next, ne- next month, I'm going to have three kids under four. Wow. Uh, so, so we're just, uh, just doing that, you know, doing that. If I'm, if I'm not working, it's uh, just full-time dad mode and I'm, I'm loving it. Awesome. Now, if folks want to find out more about Cloud Sponge, they can go to cloudsponge.com. And if they want to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, email, I guess. But if you go to cloudsponge.com, there's a Slack button. We have a Cloud Sponge community, Slack community. Um, so that's, that's I'm going to go ahead and plug that right now because I'm, I'm trying to get more people using it. Uh, and I love, I love Slack. So, so get in there, get, get, come into Slack. It's free to join. You can chat with me and the rest of the team. Uh, or just, just email, email me at, uh, J A Y at cloudspunch.com. Cool. Jay, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Uh, enjoyed the conversation. Uh, love the, the story of Cloud Sponge and, and particularly how all of this came from a week of, uh, a pivot, uh, which has turned into a, a business which is steadily growing and becoming bigger and bigger. So, yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing your your experience, your insights, and um, uh, I wish you all the best. Thanks, Omar. Cheers. All right. Thanks for listening. You can get to the show notes for this episode by going to conversionaid.com slash 117. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode, then please do take a minute to leave a review on iTunes. Your reviews really do count. They inspire and motivate me to do better, and uh, it helps to get uh, the show to get discovered by more people. So just head over to conversionaid.com slash iTunes. Thanks for listening. Until next time, take care. Thanks for listening to Conversion Aid, the podcast that shows you how to take your business to the next level and create software that sells. But things don't have to end here. Head over to conversionaid.com slash VIP and get yourself on the free VIP list where we share special insider content and news about upcoming episodes. Thanks again, and we'll talk to you next time.